Hello, we're here with Liz Berry, who is running for uh, state representative position two for the, or yeah, position yeah. two for the 36th district, or 36th district. Um, would you like to go ahead with your two minutes? Thank you, Nicole, and thank you to the eBoard for hosting this. I appreciate your diligence. You do an important job with these interviews. I'm Liz Berry, and I'm running for the state house in the 36th district, position two. I've proudly served as a PCO for Queen Anne since 2014, and my husband, Michael Hill, and I have been members of the 36th for many years, and many of you know Michael, who serves on the eBoard also. I'm a mom with two small kids. My son, George, is four, and my daughter, Eleanor, was born in September. I'm a nonprofit executive director. I run the um, Pacific Northwest's largest and oldest civil justice advocacy organization. And I'm a champion for women in leadership. I was past president of the National Women's Political Caucus of Washington, where I helped to recruit, train, and elect literally hundreds of women to public office in our state. Look, we live in the best place in the whole world, I think. Um, but affordability issues are crushing our region. Uh, working families like mine are struggling to access a decent public education and affordable quality childcare. We must act now to combat climate change. And it goes without saying, with COVID-19 devastating our communities, it's time to prioritize people, rebuild healthy communities, and get folks back to work. I'm a proven progressive leader who knows how to get things done, and that's why I'm running for the State House. I am so honored that our campaign has been endorsed by hundreds of grassroots supporters in the 36th district, dozens and dozens of notable elected leaders, and labor unions, something that I'm the most proud of. We have been so endorsed by labor unions who represent over 150,000 healthcare workers, childcare workers, grocery workers, nurses, teamsters who are fighting for us right now on the front line. They're supporting our campaign because they know that I'm gonna fight for them in the legislature. Thank you for being here tonight and I look forward to answering your questions. Time. Oh, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Good job. All right. Uh, so okay. so I'm read the chat has, now. Okay, yeah, cool. he's Got posted it. the questions into the chat and um, I have the order as being Jason, Hannah, Katie, and then Jamie. So uh, Jason, would you like to go ahead with question one? The responses to these are two minutes. Washington State is facing a significant decline in revenues due to the impact of the uh, coronavirus. Do you pledge to vote against closing this deficit with budget cuts? And what tax will you look to raise in order to deal with this crisis? Yes. Uh, to answer your question, I pledge to vote against budget cuts. I think that this is not the time for austerity measures. We saw what happened over 10 years ago with the last Great Recession, where we made cuts to programs um, for the poor and most vulnerable that we are still making up for today. We just saw, I think it was this session, we finally passed a bill that made TANF whole from 10 years ago, and that's unacceptable. We need to be prioritizing people in this difficult time. And I think that um, the, the taxes we, I would look to raise, I am not afraid to say it. I support a personal and corporate income tax. I like to say that I have never lived anywhere in my whole life where I've not paid personal income taxes besides Washington. And I've lived in Arizona and Washington, DC. Um, I also support a capital gains tax, a wealth tax. Um, and I think that this, time right now, we have real momentum built to do something about this and that we should jump at the opportunity. As Rahm Emanuel always says, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think that we need to use this as an opportunity, this crisis, to um, tackle our upside down tax code, to build on the great work of Rep. Noel Frame, my, my, my future seatmate. And instead of working on a bill for the next you know, two to four years out, let's do it in 2021 and fix this once and for all. And we need to be electing legislators, especially from districts like the 36, especially like districts from the 36 that are 85% voting Democratic districts. You should be electing progressive champions who are unafraid to do bold things and people who are effective and pragmatic leaders to get it done. And that's me. Great, thank you. 
Um, question two, Hannah. Yes. The coronavirus crisis has led to thousands of Washingtonians losing their health insurance when they lost their jobs. At a moment when healthcare is more important than ever, do you support moving to a state-based Medicare for All system? 100%. You took the words out of my mouth. You know, this COVID situation has just spotlighted so many inequities. Like we could go through the whole list, right? Climate, housing, the economy, taxes, certainly with healthcare. I mean, I support um, a single payer system 100%. Um, it's clear we have been woefully underfunding our public health system, which is a travesty. I think about my cousin Shireen, who is a WSNA nurse at UW Medical Center. She volunteered to work in the COVID unit. They have no PPE, they are begging for hazard pay, and they are not being respected by the hospitals that are having them literally risk their lives to help others. Um, furthermore, talking about healthcare, um, I believe very basically that healthcare is a right and not a privilege, and we need to adopt policies that represent this value. And I just want to touch on one more part of healthcare. It is a travesty to me that we have any women who die because they are pregnant or after they give birth. We are the richest country in the world, and we need to be doing more to act to decrease maternal health numbers in this country, especially among black and brown women. It's unacceptable to me as someone who just had a baby in September. It's raw for me. It's, new. it's something that's in my mind. And that's why we need to be electing legislators with more lived experiences um, who have just gone through the experiences um, that help advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves. So this is something else I want to tackle. I don't want it to be studies. I want to put real action behind tackling some of these very difficult issues that are facing our community. Great, thank you. Uh, question three, Katie. Great. Uh, going back to taxes, um, what is your plan for dealing with Washington State's regressive upside down tax code? Will you lead on taxing large corporations and wealthy individuals? Do you support a progressive income tax, a capital gains tax, a more robust estate tax, and a tax on companies paying excessive compensation to some employees? Yes, all of those things. We should be saying that if we're running in this district. Um, so my plan to deal with this upside down tax code, so I am very aware that I will be coming in as a freshman, as a baby legislator who might not have, you know, all of the leverage that some of our veterans do. But what I can do is something that I do well and that I've experienced doing. I can build coalitions. So similar to what Pramila Jayapal, who we all adore, has done in the Congress, right? She has gotten together with her progressive Democratic colleagues. She has brought a voting block of people together who say to leadership, these are the one, two, three, four things we need to see in this package for you to get our block of votes. Uh, the strength in numbers makes us more powerful. And I believe that I can do that as a freshman, come in to the legislature, put together a coalition of like-minded people who want to build on the momentum with the economic crisis we're seeing with COVID-19 to say, now is the time because we are seeing this 10, they're saying now could be $10 billion hole because with sale taxes being so low um, and other taxes that we depend on to help fill that hole, we are gonna be in a really, really bad position. So I believe everything needs to be on the table. Uh, progressive income tax, progressive corporate taxes, um, sale, more robust sales tax, um, capital gains tax, okay. and, and the other taxes you've mentioned. One last thing I want to say, because I have 30 seconds left, is my sister-in-law is actually a tax attorney, and I talk to her about this a lot. She works for the Revenue Service in California. They have about an 8% corporate income tax, and they bring in billions of dollars a year in revenue. If we just did like a 2 or 3% corporate income tax, think about all the revenue we could bring in. It just seems like a no-brainer to me. Great. Thank you. All right, and we're looking at question four, Jamie. Thanks. Um, just so you know, Liz, it got just repasted in its entirety in case the one you saw before got cut off. So it's, do you support efforts to combat the economic impacts of sy systemic racism by supporting laws 
that target inequality in areas like housing, education, and intergenerational wealth. Please provide examples of such laws that you would advocate for and lead on. This is such a critical issue, and it's important to frame it for all policy discussion. Look, I understand that I see the world through a lens of a privileged white woman who's well-educated, who lives in a privileged, affluent community like the 36. I own that, and I always work to challenge myself and uplift people who didn't have the same start in life that I did. But institutional racism and economic injustice will continue to be barriers for people of color and working people if we don't do something about it and own it. We can't fix the criminal justice system if we don't address racism and racial inequity. We can't fix education if we don't address poverty. There are kids that are home right now that aren't getting the meals they get at school, that don't have access to the internet, that don't have access to computers, and are not um, having the same chances at a decent education as those kids who are living in more privileged households. We can't fix healthcare without addressing environmental racism and injustice. We need to fight for systematic change and we need legislators who are gonna stand up, fight for it, and ask the appropriate questions from the people that need to be heard. I have experienced this issue. As president of the Women's Political Caucus of Washington State, I established a diversity committee to encourage and recruit more women of color to run for office. I established a training for women of color, by women of color, because I believe that our democracies should be reflective of the people they serve. I also have experience with this as executive director of the Washington State Association for Justice. When I took over four years ago, within one year, I had parity, gender parity on my board, 50% women, 50% men, which if you know anything about lawyers, it's a very hard thing to achieve. Secondly, we increased the people of color who served on our board by threefold, because I believe again that institutions need to be representative of the people they serve. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. And now we will open it up to questions. Um, okay, I'm ready. Hit me. Hit me. Up. Yeah, one minute a piece for the responses. Okay. You got that, Laura? All right, perfect. Um, so if you guys would just raise your hand or message me, either one would work. Any questions? You could ask literally anything you would like. <laughs> Mackenzie, go ahead. Where is he? I can't see him. Yes. How about that? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I like to see you while you're talking. There you are. Hi. Okay, yeah, we've got it on the spotlight, so it'll only show you to others. So, a uh, question I have is what do you feel like are the two biggest um, issues for District 36 that you could have an effect on if you were elected? And what kind of legislation would you push for those um, to put those into effect? So the first that come to mind is right away are climate change and the maritime community. So I'll tackle the second one first. Gail Tarleton has left an incredible legacy and a very deep connection to our maritime community. And as we know, the 36 is in the heart of it. Um, it's a $4 billion industry that literally, you know, is right in the center of our district. I want, you know, there are going to be big issues facing us, like what do we do with the Ballard Bridge? How do we make sure we keep that a freight Pretty quarter, tight. a freight quarter, ooh, that happened quickly. Um, I'll move on to the next one, um, climate change. We also live in one of the most beautiful parts of the state, and we need to be making sure that we don't ignore science and research, just like with what happened with COVID, and that we address climate change with the same intensity and urgency so we can create a Green New Deal for all Washingtonians. Great, thank you. Uh, Kelsey, would you like to take the next one? Absolutely. Hi, Liz. Um, so this is kind of going back to question four, um, a little bit about economic impacts on systemic racism. So you mentioned what you had done previously in your work with um, previous organizations and your um, current position. So what would you do as a first step if you were to get elected pointed to many issues that are occurring within the 36? 
I mean, I think the biggest one that I live every day is education because my kids, my, my son George is in public preschool program at Daybreak Center, you know, Daybreak Star in Magnolia Park. You know, he's in a, a public program. Most of the kids get their tuition subsidized by the city. Most of them get their main meal at school. Um, every week they send home library books because most of them probably don't have books at home. Um, they also send home fresh produce because a lot of the kids don't have access to fresh produce. And it is an absolutely fabulous program that I think we could, should expand statewide. 30 seconds. I, I think about also what's, you know, how our kids are struggling right now, the ones that are living in poverty, to be homeschooled. Like, how do you get homeschooled when you don't have access to Wi-Fi, right? And you don't have a computer. I mean, I believe that internet should be a right, that everyone should have access to basic free internet. And you cannot level the playing field for those kids right now at home who don't have access to those things. So I think addressing the poverty issues that are at the core of our education system are crucial. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Hannah, I believe you are next. Hannah, there you are. Hey. Um, so I have a question about uh, taxes too, um, specifically about another sort of one that I, I don't feel like always gets talked about that much, but can you speak to me a little bit about um, your feelings about the B&O tax and the way that having a flat tax there is like also pretty uh, regressive? Yes, yes. And actually I've been talking to some more small businesses about this because they're very negatively impacted by it. I think, and I wanna know more about this, and I know that Noel is doing a lot of work in it and also doing a lot of economic modeling to make sure that if we do bring in these other tax structures, like an income and a sale and a um, corporate income taxes and tax gains, um, how much revenue will that actually bring in to kind of like uplift all the boats? I have heard arguments that are interesting about repealing the B&O tax because it is actually a very regressive tax. And I would be supportive of that, but I wanna learn more about it. I wanna make sure that if we are gonna work really hard on this overall package, that we, that we examine all of the different taxes and we think about how they impact each one and that we're not putting undue harm on people that are struggling, especially our small businesses right now, but they're literally like 50% of them might not exist in a month. And that is really scary and, and sad. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah. next, next up is Brittany. Hi, uh, I just wanted to give you another minute to talk about your environmental priorities and specifically oh, yeah. from the perspective of a just transition. A, dr a just, transition. just transition. Can you, can you tell me more about that? Um, so the framework, like the Great Green New Deal sort of framework that prioritizes marginalized people and you yeah. know, moves away from an extractive economy towards yeah, cooperative and that sort of thing. Look, like, I think it's really important for you to know that I believe in science, right? I believe that climate change is man-made. I believe that this is an urgent problem that's gonna be controversial and it's gonna be expensive and that should not make us scared. You know, I believe that we should be holding polluters accountable by taxing them. And like you said earlier, I think this whole issue needs to be framed around climate justice and equity. And what that means to me is my son's best friend, Neshoba, who lives in South Seattle, has the same right to breathe the same quality of air and drink the same quality of water as my son, George, who lives in Queen Anne. This issue is just as much about equity and justice as it is about saving our planet. Great, thank you. Uh, Jamie. Hi, so my question would be just given the current state of challenge for small businesses here in Washington, what your anticipated agenda would be over the next year or two in terms of showing, shearing up that part of our economy? Such a great question. I mean, I think that we need more advocates on the federal level to make sure that more um, loans are, more funding for the loan programs are approved because I know a lot. So I, so just so you know, I'm the daughter of a small business owner. Also, I rep, you know, my membership organization that I'm a nonprofit executive director of is made up of 2,400 small business owners, okay? So this is something that's very personal. A lot of my members applied for those, those loans and there was no money left. And it, there, it didn't matter if you went to the most powerful bank in town or you went to the tiny community bank. 
It was, there was no rhyme or reason to it. And people are really struggling. We need people at a local level who are willing to advocate and put the squeeze on our federal allies to make sure that more funding is put into those programs. I think, you know, going back to the B&O tax, again, let's use this crisis, you know, to our advantage and put real momentum into tax form and tax reform that will help small businesses looking at taxes like the B&O tax, which I hear over and over and over again from small businesses that they find very cumbersome. Um, was that time? Okay. Yes. yes. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we are actually ready to hear a one minute wrap up. Um, if you want to just uh, tell voters why they should vote for you. I am so grateful for your time. I just want to thank you again for considering endorsing my campaign. I, what I'm most proud of, I think, so far in the campaign is the depth and breadth of support that we have received from hundreds of grassroots supporters in the 36th district, from dozens and dozens of notable elected leaders, and again, the labor unions. Like, these are the people working on the front lines for us right now. Six out of the seven labor unions who have endorsed in this race have still endorsed my campaign. I really think that my leadership experience stands out. That shows that I'm ready to lead and I'm ready to go to Olympia and get things done. I've never shied away from a big fight or from doing hard things. And that's what I will do as your representative. Thank you again for your time. And I'd be honored, honored, honored to earn your endorsement. Thank you very much.